Excellent. So welcome everybody. Hey, it's Ajahn Brahm back again. And uh, this is uh, for a lovely meditation talk. And that'll be followed by a um, uh, going to toilet and meditation, and then followed by just a, a guided meditation as usual. And then the, later on, we'll do the Sutta class. But for the, uh, the talk this evening, uh, you know, this morning for you, this afternoon for me, that sometimes when we have difficulties and problems in our meditation, just know how do we deal with them? Solving the problems in meditation. And also asking yourself, are they really problems? Or is it just we're looking at things with uh, too much negativity? And sometimes we do find that, oh, sometimes people, they try and meditate and they think they can't do it. And they take it like a personal, that they're not up to the task of meditating. But then sometimes things happen. One of my job is trying to encourage and inspire so that people can do things they never expected they could do. Even for myself, you know, when I first started meditating, sometimes you could see some of these um, old monks and nuns, they could meditate for hours so peacefully. And I thought, oh, I'll never be able to do that. But just over those years, the patience and the understanding, soon you just you know, found out how you too can find that stillness and find just how you can make the body just so peaceful and light. And so you can sit there for a long time without needing to move. Of course, that, when I first started meditating, I thought that was impossible. You can't do that. But little by little, I always find that the mind can sometimes be so, so uh, small and it's just what it thinks is possible, what it thinks it can do. And little by little, little, you find you just break those boundaries. One of the great things is like using insight. You know, the insight, there's a lot of times people talk about insight meditation. There's no such thing as insight meditation against the calm meditation. They always go together. Indeed, the function of insight is to overcome problems so you can find some peace, some tranquility and some joy. And the joy strengthens the power of your insight. You can see deeper, you can see more, you can understand more. So little by little, we practice both of these, but especially when there's any difficulties in your meditation, I love you know, using things like insight just to see exactly what is going on. What is that problem? So little by little, you know, we, uh, one of the problems, I don't think I've told the story yet on this retreat, but it was an inspiring story for me. On this particular retreat, I said it wasn't a retreat, sorry, this was uh, in Thailand. There was this young novice. This young novice was listening to one of the talks by Ajahn Chah. Now, many people might think, oh, Ajahn Chah was always so inspiring. He's always so amazing to listen to. But that wasn't always the case. I remember sometimes Ajahn Chah giving a talk for three or four or five hours. And then when it, the talk was finished, all these senior monks, I thought better off, they came out afterwards and said, that Ajahn Chah is mad, he's crazy, <laughs> or whatever. Because they didn't really understand the talk. And on that occasion, Ajahn Chah wasn't really on song. Just like you know, everybody, they can't always just be on their, their ultimate, their highest uh, performance level. But on this other occasion, you know, Ajahn Chah was giving a talk and it went on for a long period of time. And you know, monks were understanding this. Uh, sometimes you get a little bit of wonderful teachings, you know, maybe two or three percent or something, but those wonderful teachings, they were worth listening to the whole talk because they actually explained so much of the Dharma you hadn't understood before. But on this particular occasion, it was giving a long talk, and it wasn't the things which were said were important, but it's actually the things which were experienced by this little novice, which made the, the talk really fantastic. Because this little, little novice is maybe about 10, 11, 12, 13 years, I don't know exactly the age, but he wasn't sort of a, a mature, um, a mature novice or a monk yet. 
In those days, people would join monasteries for so many reasons, and sometimes it was a social, social safety net for, for young, young beings. At least they could be looked after, get food, won't be sort of abused, and they could actually get a bit of an education and cared for. And anyway, this little novice, apparently, he told the story afterwards, he was getting really bored as the talk went on and on and on and on. And as he got more and more bored, he started thinking and repeating to himself, when is Ajahn Chah going to stop? When is he going to stop? When is he going to stop? And it became like a repetitious, like a mantra he was saying to himself. When is he going to stop? When is he going to stop? When is he going to stop? In these days, <coughs> sometimes we sort of start thinking, uh, are we there yet, mum? Are we there yet, mum? Are we there yet, mum, when you're in a car? And for him, it was when is he going to stop? So all those monks, you know, they sort of, they became monks or senior nuns. They became this in order to have become enlightened, to get something. But me, I'm only here because I have to. I've got nowhere else to live. It's unfair. So this is from office. When is he going to stop? When is he going to stop? And then there was a time when this little novice had this insight, which you know, changed the whole uh, problem into something which he thought was a problem, but now is something much different. Instead of thinking, when is he going to stop? This novice changed it around. When am I going to stop? That's what this novice thought. When am I going to stop? And this little novice stopped. When he opened his eyes again, it was the morning. He hadn't um, had a heart attack. He hadn't fallen asleep. He got so perfectly still when he said, when am I going to stop? But this is from office, uh, entered deep samadhi, a jhana. When he opened his eyes again, all the monks had already departed uh, after the end of the talk. And they'd also had a few hours sleep and then they'd gone to the morning arms round. He'd be sitting there quiet for many hours. He had stopped. Because of that, that he opened his eyes and the, it was time to go for arms round or the monks already left for arms round, but he didn't mind missing lunch that day, the one meal of the day, simply because his mind was just so happy and joyful. He got into his first deep meditation simply because he'd use the insight when am I going to stop? To stop in this present moment, stop wanting, stop complaining, stop thinking. And when he stopped like that, the whole world stops for you. You go inside the mind into a deep meditation. Because that's, again, one of the, the great insights on how we meditate. Stopping meditation. Even for those of you who know the story of the Buddha, that when the big elephant, Nali, uh, sorry, when Angulimala was trying to uh, mow down the Buddha, uh, the reason was with uh, Nalagiri, the elephant, he was, he was fed sort of alcohol by somebody who wanted to kill the Buddha. And the big elephant fed alcohol, was drunk, was let loose. Sorry, I'm mixing up the metaphors again. Angulimala <laughs> was trying to kill the Buddha. And as he was trying to kill the Buddha, the Buddha was running away from Angulimala. I have to do the Nalakiri um, story afterwards. Uh, Angulimala was running after the Buddha, trying to kill him. And even though the Buddha was really quite old at this time, he's was, was in his 70s, late 70s, when Angulimala tried to attack him. And what happened was that Angulimala couldn't catch up with him. This old monk, just walking very peacefully, very calmly, exerted this wonderful power so that Angulimala could not catch up with him. And so Angulimala shouted out at the Buddha with his sword raised high, Stop, monk! Stop! 
And what uh, the Buddha replied was, I have stopped, you stop, Angulimara. And of course the Buddha was moving. And Angulimara wondered, what on earth do you mean, stop? And so that became a powerful mantra for Angulimara to stop. To stop not just breaking precepts by killing people, but just by stop. There's what we call the outflowing of the mind, the asawa of wanting, desire, and ill will. To stop all of that. Allow the mind just to be still in this moment. To stop going into the future. To stop going into the past to stop these thoughts talking to oneself, to stop this fear which sometimes comes up, to stop this judgment, to stop and just be in this moment and see what happens next. And of course, I go to did that and soon he became not just a monk, but fully enlightened and a great sort of example to people of what happens when you stop. So because of that, when people in the world say, oh, you know, oh, they have crosses on churches, they have uh, the domes of mosques and the minarets, but where do we have the, the articles of Buddhism, say in a, a city like London? Where can you see Buddhism on the streets of Perth? I say at every intersection where you see stop sign. Those little red signs telling the traffic, stop. When I see one of those, I think, wow, that reminds me of the Buddha telling Angulimala, stop, Angulimala. <laughs> so if you want to, you can actually see all of these signs in the world and they can remind us, they can give us the insight into just how to be peaceful, how to stop. When you stop, trying to get somewhere, trying to go somewhere, trying to um, get rid of things. When you stop, then you rest. Energy comes back, mind becomes peaceful, and eventually it becomes so peaceful, it becomes energized and free. It's one of those wonderful little uh, mantras you can say to yourself, stop and see what it means. When you use a word like a mantra in meditation, it's a word, it has a meaning, but a lot of times people haven't explored the meaning that deeply. Stop, we think it just means things finishing, but then you start something else. So stop everything. Stop time. Stop the mind thinking. Close the eyes and stop sight. Stop reacting. Be peaceful, be still. And see the whole world stop with you. When it stops, then you have the time, the space to see much more deeply into what really is happening in our mind and in our world. So these are little, little tricks of the trade, little insights to overcome problems with meditation. Even just, I told the story to a gentleman who was wanting some advice in meditation this morning, or just after lunch. When I have my lunch, there's no, no such thing as a free lunch for a monk. You always have to give some, some teachings or blessing back or something. I don't mind. It's a good price, good lunch, good price. Just give, give teachings anyway. You don't do it for anything. It's just a joy to give as people gave to you. But anyway, the stillness, which comes from stopping. And I told him about the, you know, the story of the cup which I've already told you this, so I'll do it very quickly. How do you keep the water in this cup perfectly still? Holding it, never gets still. Mindful, 
not still. Focusing, concentrating, mm, not still. You put it down, it becomes still all by itself. Patiently, you wait, and it becomes still. It's not supposed to happen. You're supposed to make things happen. You find you allow things to happen. You allow it to become still. It becomes beautifully still all by itself. And Ajahn Chah would always say about the, uh, the only reason why a leaf moves is because the wind is blowing. You stop the wind blowing. You guard that little bush or that flower. You guard it for long enough, you know it will become still all by itself. It will stop moving. And when things stop and they cease and become still, it becomes fantastic. Just what you see and how beautiful peace is and how energized it is and how positive it is. So when I say that that's one of the tricks is when in meditation doesn't seem to be working, having problems, just remember to stop. I don't mean stop meditating. I mean, to actually to stop reacting, make peace with things. Now, I will tell the story of, of um, Nandi was so, ooh, of uh, oh, Nadagi with the elephant. Yeah, <laughs> Nadagi the elephant in a moment. But at the same time, as now learning how to stop and be still and peaceful, it also reminded me of the first book which I wrote, The Opening the Door of Your Heart. Just know how that uh, there was one, uh, it was a poem which I, I read a long time ago as a Chinese poem. And I thought it was just so brilliant as a way of practice. I wrote it in the book and I often remember it and talk about it to others. It was like, grant yourself a moment of peace and you'll realize how foolishly you scurried about. Be kind, and you know the judgment of others was far too harsh. And also to be silent and realize you've talked too much. Simple, but especially like the first uh, line of that little th three stanza poem. Grant yourself a moment of peace. And I like this way it's like, grant yourself, give yourself, give yourself permission to be peaceful. And then you realize just how foolishly you scurried about in your mind. So often I say to myself when I start meditating, I don't do this as often as I should do because I used to do this so much a lot when I started meditating. I sat down and said, this is my meditation time. It's not the time for planning things. It's not the time for writing my autobiography or planning my talk. It's not the time for figuring out how I can solve problems. It's a time for meditating, for being still, for stopping. And so I said to my mind, I'm going to grant myself half an hour, I was only a young lay meditator, half an hour of peace. This time I put aside for meditating, for nothing else. This is a time I put into my spiritual practice. And when I sort of tell myself that as a resolution, when I begin the meditation, it's like telling my mind, so this is what I would like you to do. I'm giving yourself this opportunity for half an hour just to be still, to be silent, to be peaceful. It's a gift I'm giving you. And then the idea of granting yourself the gift of peace became, I expanded that later on, that sometimes when it's your birthday or when it's, uh, say, Christmas coming up, you want to give like, gifts to people. And they ask you, what do you want, personal, just for you? Not for Anakampa, not for, for Fenwal Chanda, not for monasteries, but what do you want just for you? I often tell people what I really, really, really want is a gift of peace. So you can get a little box and in that box, just write down just the word peace as beautifully as you can. 
put it in the box with some expensive gift wrapping paper on the outside, a little ribbon. And then we say it's to, to um, Ajahn Brahm or to Venerable Chanda or whoever else you want to give that gift to. To Aya Chanda with love and respect from, say, from Vinny. And then she opens it. Oh, I wonder what's in here. And when you open it, you find out it's a gift of peace. It's only a word on a piece of paper. But when you actually receive that gift, you understand what that meaning of that gift really is. Peace. And then sometimes I, I tell people, people are a bit depressed, having a bit of loneliness in their life. I say, do that to yourself. Get a little box and do it any old time. And actually works, people, bless them, they actually do this little exercise. They <laughs> write out peace very nicely or some image of peace. And they put it in a box. They just uh, put wrapping paper around it, nice ribbon, a nice greeting card. And it, but it's to me, to me, Emmy, with love from me. You open it up. When you see inside, it's the gift you always wanted, the gift of peace. And when you receive that gift of peace, you're granting yourself peace. You make a little ceremony out of it. It has more power. It goes deeper inside of you, which means you can then maybe just sit down calmly in any place you can and then just enjoy that peace. Sometimes meditation, again, people think you have to do it. You don't do meditation. You let meditation happen. You let peace grow inside of you. You grant yourself as a gift moments of peace. Sometimes in my stage of monastic life, when I uh, say, what am I meditating for? And sometimes I honestly... But I sit down and I said, this meditation I'm going to do next is a gift to the Buddha and all my teachers. I don't really care if they appreciate it or not. I don't really worry whether it's a deep meditation or not. But the fact I'm doing this, not for myself, it's not a selfish pursuit. It is a gift to the, the people which I respected the most in this world. People like the Buddha, people like an Ajahn Chah. So I dedicate this. I don't de dedicate merits. The Buddha doesn't need any more good karma. That's like giving a donation to Bill Gates. And this is a gift, expecting nothing back in return out of my gift to the Buddha. And I sit down, and it makes it much easier to get deep meditation. And it's not for me, it's for something else, for the Buddha. So that's a, another little way, grant yourself a moment of peace. And you realize how foolishly you scurried about. And one of the other great similes I said I was to say about uh, the, uh, the, I keep, the elephant, Nalagiri. And then that story, Nalagiri again was, was intoxicated by one of the Buddha's enemies, was running down the street when the Buddha was coming on arms round. And when the Buddha was coming on arms round, the street was so narrow as it was in those days in the cities. I still remember some of the streets in London just were so narrow. But nevertheless, they could get a horse passing by on either side the car going, <laughs> passing one another, it's just too big, the cars. I mean, like in today's traffic, but in those days, little horses, they could pass by pretty easily with people walking. But in those narrow streets, which you can maybe imagine 2,500 years ago, when the Buddha was walking with his monks in one direction, and this crazy, intoxicated elephant was on the rampage in the other direction. And they were about to, to meet one another. All the 
villagers were running away, jumping over the walls, going inside their houses. And they were warning the monks, please get out of the way, there's a raging elephant coming, get out of the way now. And all the monks, except for uh, the Buddha and Ananda, all of those monks just ran away, except for the Buddha and his faithful attendant. And the attendant stood in front of the Buddha, let the elephant kill me, I want to protect my teacher. And the Buddha pushed him out of the way gently. He said, I can look after this. And so this big elephant was charging towards the Buddha. I do, I do embellish the story, but I think this is legitimate because it makes it more meaningful and still pretty accurate to what happened. And so this huge elephant charging, crazy, mad. And the Buddha did have immense psychic powers, could have suddenly disappeared from that place and just you know, gone to another place where he was safe. He could have used great force and being able to, to stop Angulimala. Or as I sometimes mentioned, he could have picked up Angulimala. I'm mixing up the people again. He could have picked up uh, the elephant by the trunk and twirled him three times around his head and thrown him over the Ganges. But that might have hurt the elephant. That's not the Buddha's way. And it could have run away, just like he ran away from Angulimala in a way which was not too fast, not too slow. So Angulimala could run as fast as he can, could always see the Buddha, but couldn't catch him. Stop Angulimala, as I just mentioned. But instead, the Buddha just stood there as the elephant charged. Now, I don't know about you, but sometimes I've seen such peaceful, beautiful people in the world. They're so kind, they're so gentle. There's no way you can harm them. It's just looking at them, or looking at animals in the wild, beings who are just, you can see their personality, you can see them, and they're, all they need to do is to be protected. We can't harm them. It's just too soft and gentle. And there's too much kindness in there to harm them. And the Buddha just showed that kindness to this rampaging elephant. Something like Nalagiri, mad elephant, the door of my heart is open to you, totally open to you even if you want to pick me up and smash me against the wall, you want to squash me with your feet. I will never be angry at you. I will never uh, blame you. Dear elephant, may you be peaceful. May you grant yourself some peace and some kindness and forgiveness. And some beings in this world, when they say things like that, they really mean it. And the animals cannot harm you, simply because you're too kind, too soft, too peaceful. And apparently, just after a few minutes, or a few seconds, and when the big elephant had caught up with the Buddha, the elephant bowed down to the Buddha lowered his head and his trunk, and the elephant was stroking, the, sorry, the Buddha was stroking the elephant's trunk. There, there, Anguli, there, there, <laughs> Nalagiri, there, there. Nalagiri's intoxication vanished there, simply because the Buddha was kind. Now, you wonder why I tell that story, because sometimes, how you call that the Nalagiri strategy, when people have lots and lots and lots of problems in their meditation. You know, people actually said this to me, even though it's logically impossible, this is how it feels. They said they've got all the five hindrances at the same time in their meditation. The mind is going crazy, it won't stop, it's just not peaceful. And I said, remember that story, it's like, it's like you're being charged up by a mad elephant. All the hindrances are once, you can't find any peace. 
then you say to your mind, dear mind, kind mind, whatever you want to do to me is fine. Whatever you want to send me crazy, you want to send me, kill me or whatever, dear mind, I accept you. The door of my heart is fully open to this moment or whatever happens. You try that with sincerity and find all of those hindrances slow down and stop. It's as if you build up the power of those hindrances simply because you don't understand them and how they work. You allow them to be. You don't sort of own them, no afraid of them. You give loving kindness towards them. And that loving kindness is incredibly powerful, how it reduces the impact of those hindrances, of those defilements, to the point that they assume like the elephant bowing down before you. We just stroke them. They're there, hindrances. They're there wanting ill will, sloth and torpor, restlessness and doubt. You find that that is a powerful, powerful way to overcome all problems in meditation. You ask yourself, what do you want? Nothing. When you don't want anything, the hindrances lose their power. And not wanting anything is the meaning of the door of my heart is open no matter who, <coughs> who you are, what you do, what's happening. This beautiful sense of kindness, kindness to yourself. And the other little story, which again I told today, that's what's fresh in my mind, was sometimes, you know, your mind can kind of rebel. It has had enough. It doesn't want to do this anymore. I'm not going to wash my breath. I'm not going to sit down. I'm not going to do this. And a rebellious mind is overcome by understanding this story. And I remember when I first told us, there's two parts of the story. I, Again, I told this this afternoon to somebody, and I may have told it to you one of the first days of the retreat. But then there was the story of the, the young boy who's uh, had an argument with his mother and told his mother, you don't love me anymore, I'm leaving. And many of you know that story. But when I told it to this a woman from Singapore who was uh, training as a, a therapist, and she was staying in monastery for a couple of weeks in order to learn some more meditation. When I told the story, oh, she was actually, <laughs> she was, you might think it's disrespectful, but I don't mind it. It was fun. It was a great story. And so when I was telling the story, she was bursting out laughing and literally, I mean, literally rolling on the floor, holding her tummy. <laughs> and because after I said, what did, you, what did you react like that for? That's a problem something so similar happened to me. When I was a young girl, I had an argument with my mother and I told her I was leaving home. And she too helped me pack my bags. She didn't argue with me. She helped pack my bags. But in the story of the first boy, where he was uh, given uh, some lunch by his mum, his favourite lunch. In Singapore, his mother never had time to actually make a lunch for her, uh, her, her daughter. Instead she, instead, she gave her daughter $20 Singaporean to buy her own lunch. And she didn't open the door and walk down the garden path. In Singapore, they opened the door and went to the elevator. And then the little girl was just tall enough to be able to, actually, you know, she was uh, uh, tall enough to press the, the, the button to take the elevator, the lift down to the ground floor. But she said she only got to the ground floor when she felt terribly homesick because her mother had treated her with such kindness. And I said, oh, if you want to leave home, that's fine by me. I'll help you pack your bag. And look, here's $20 for your lunch. I don't want you to starve and please keep in contact. She was so kind to the daughter 
who was going a bit crazy. But when the daughter got to the ground floor she, of the apartment block, she already uh, missed her, her mummy and pressed the button to go back to the floor in which she lived. When the lift doors opened, of course, her mother was still waiting where she knew what would happen, and the daughter would come back. But the way she dealt with that problem was actually to let the daughter go. You want to leave her, fine by me. But you can always come back any time you want. And that's actually how you deal with the mind. If your mind has a problem, it wants to go fantasizing about this, it wants to get upset about that, it wants to, to dream about something else, it doesn't want to behave. Be kind to your mind. That's what you want to do, fine by me. And so you give your, <laughs> give your mind permission. Off you go. I'm not going to try and control you. I'll be waiting for you when you come back. That seems a bit counterproductive, but it actually works. If you try and keep your mind at home, try and always to keep it in line, always keep it on the breath or keep it in the present moment or keep it doing this or keep it doing that. Sometimes that, that is too much force and your mind will eventually rebel and give up meditation. Instead, give it kindness. And then you'll be surprised and how well that works. Kindness power, meta power, wisdom power is always far more effective than willpower in dealing with the problems of meditation. And that's where you do get the insights into this. The problems will come up. When those problems do come up, you always remember that those are, are where you get your wisdom from, your compassion from. If you didn't have problems, you'd have you know, no down to grow mangoes in your garden. It's the problems which give you that, that power and happiness to understand life. You can't understand it any other way. That's how I understand life anyway. The little insights. One of the other great insights, which is really powerful, is that just remember that as the Buddha said, you know, this is anatta, no self. So you think, who's doing the meditation? So who's responsible? After a while, you realize that you're not doing the meditation. Your teacher is. And I don't mean this to brag about myself, because this is how I always think. Ajahn Chah is, is giving a talk uh, this morning uh, in Europe over Zoom. Because so often, I don't know what I'm going to say next. I try and disappear as much as I can to let go and allow the Dhamma just to come out. It's not personal. It's not coming from me. When you actually learn how to trust in that, then you do actually find that when you don't do things, you don't own things. There's nothing to feel guilty about. There's no one to complain to you find that the mind becomes very peaceful. There's no one here. You learn how to disappear when you're meditating. You don't own anything. When you don't own things, you can never lose anything. Something comes, something goes. That's the nature of our life, but we don't own it. So we don't get upset when something disappears. We know we don't own anything, it's just uh, no self. We also know that we don't need to gain anything. What do you want? You don't want anything in the whole world because there's no owner. You achieve anything when there's no one in there. I always had this image of you know, if you, you win something, you go on this podium and get these gold medals or silver medals or bronze medals from someone. You've made it, you're a winner. But then as Buddhism and meditation in the practice of the Dhamma, we don't actually win anything. There's no being in there to, to 
no neck or head there to hang a gold medal on or a silver medal on. There's no one to actually to, to pin a button on to say you're a winner. And in fact, instead of being a winner, instead we'd prefer to be losers. And this is one of the, the great insights years and years ago. I don't want to be a winner anymore. If you're a winner, you accumulate too much stuff. With the stuff comes problems of caring for and storing it. And then there's people expect you to win again the next time. So I don't want to be a winner. I want to be a loser. As a loser, what you're really losing, losing possessions. You're losing the past and the future. You're losing just all of your conceit, all of your who you think you are. Being a loser can be very cool. And that's actually what the Buddha did. You know, he came from a very wealthy family, lost all of that. He came from uh, a very safe place. He lost all of that. He lost all of his, even lost his first five disciples when he decided to look after his body and practice jhana meditations. They came back again later. He had no possessions, just his bowl and his rug. And just, he lost everything. All his defilements, all his hindrances, all his fears, all the past, all the future, all of the needing to do things, all of the, the need to have things. Everything which makes people work and hope and dream and be upset about in our world, he lost all of that. And when you lose everything, you have nothing to fear anymore. I'm not talking about a Buddha. Didn't own anything. And I always say that, because this is the word these days, the biggest loser. That with the greatest respect, the Buddha was the biggest loser. The greatest respect to see someone like an Ajahn Chah, he was a big loser too. Not the biggest loser, that was the Buddha. And I try to emulate my, emulate my practice as much as possible in the same direction. And also gives the same, so I'm a loser too. Not a winner, a loser. Lose as much as you possibly can of your mental problems, emotional attachments, desires, conceits, greed, hatred, and delusion. Lose all of that. When you do become a loser, you see that those are the really happy, peaceful people who are getting vulnerable from anything in this world. And lastly, because I value losing, there's a great, skillful solution to the problems of your meditation. I always tell the people who I teach meditation to, please get lost. <laughs> get lost is a bad word to say to people when you explain what you really mean then get lost it can be a great teaching to say, let go of all the defilements and become happy and free and disappear. Okie dokie. So now is the toilet break. So please lose some of the, some of the things in your body <laughs> which are causing irritations. Okie dokie, five minutes, and then we'll do the meditation on getting lost. Very good. You know, sometimes that when People take you around to go to another appointment somewhere or to give a talk or a meditation somewhere. I kind of like it when they get lost. They can't find the way. Because that's when you explore more of the town in which you're in. 
I remember <laughs> so many times that somebody got me like a, a taxi when I was in Kuala Lumpur to take me to the airport. And the taxi driver kept getting lost. Because I actually saw there's a big sign, airport, in the opposite direction we were traveling. <laughs> so I need to go airport. We got there in time. So when you do get lost, it can be sometimes very interesting. You discover more things on the wayside which you've never seen before. And even if you don't get there on time, it doesn't matter that much. There was this one guy, there's a true story, he came and told me the story himself, over in Perth. He was in Mumbai many, many years ago. And he was going from his hotel to the airport to go back to Europe somewhere. And that uh, his taxi driver arrived late at the airport. So he arrived late at the hotel to pick him up. And when he took him to the airport, he got lost. And this poor gentleman sort of, it's a true story. He's, this gentleman told me that he was getting more and more irritated and anxious that he might miss his flight. And that would just put so many other stuff in, in, in jeopardy. It was really important he had to get his flight. And then what happened next was that they managed to get to the airport. He was hoping because the flights were often delayed. I think it was like a KL, KLM flight. But anyway, when he got to the airport, he realized for once that flight took off on time. Because he saw it ascending into the sky from the runway. And he was really critical of his driver for making this his plane. But then, it's a true story, he saw the plane come down and crash with everybody on board killed. So it's a true story. And afterwards, thank you driver for being late. Thank you, have a tip. What he thought was negative turned out to have saved his life. And that changed his whole way of existence, realizing that sometimes when we measure things, we don't know what we're really measuring. And after a while, we realize that getting lost, being late, meditation not working out as we expected, sometimes one of the most wonderful things in the whole world. So, be positive the best blood group in the whole world. <laughs> okay. So is that enough of a toilet break? Very good. No, Rene, I think it's still on the loop because I can't see her now. You might be meditating. On the toilet? <laughs> <laughs> no. no wishes. <laughs> okay. The rest of the next room. Okay. So now we can perhaps then do uh, the meditation, a guided meditation for you all on how to get lost, how to stop, how to give yourself moments of peace. There we go. So, sitting comfortably, close your eyes. You know, sometimes you meditate, you don't really, sorry, you don't really just uh, physically move or get lost, but sometimes you take away just all of the interest and connection with where you're sitting. It's happened to me a few times, and after a you know, reasonably long sit, you open your eyes and just, where am I? It takes you a while to connect with the place, the physical place where you're sitting. It's like you lose all of the, the perceptions of the physical place as you go deeper inside. We have to be able to do that, to lose connections, you know, especially with your body, which can be old, can be aching. It's nice to lose the perception of your body even a little bit of it. 
So in order to do that, I just make sure I'm aware of the body before I lose it. So I can feel the sensations of my feet on my little mat on top of which is my computer. This is my meditation station. It's not my uh, laptop station right now. I just fidget my feet a little bit to make them the, the best comfort. It's not just comfort good enough, which I'm after. I want the sort of comfort which I can maintain for the 40 minutes of the meditation, which can give me a lot of peace and stillness. So I'm going to adjust my body a bit because the way I'm sitting is going to be very sore if I don't adjust right now. That's better. Can I check my legs? My nose is itchy, so if you open your eyes, you'll see me scratching my nose. I feel my body with my legs and my knees. I'm kind to them. I let them be. I'm saying I care about you. May your knees be happy and well. Thighs may be happy and well. I don't just say it, I mean it. And but may be happy and well. And to make sure, I just ask my butt, do you want to be moved? Adjusted. The reason I said that because my butt told me I should move. It's a tiny bit, that's so much better. And then my back. In order to get my back to be nice and comfortable, I stretch it. I just go too far the other way, tensing it up, stretching it, and then letting go. And the body just actually falls into a nice, comfortable state. I've got to go to stretching first of all, and then letting go, loosening. And it falls into a place of so it's really quite nice. Do the same with my shoulders. Stretch them, scrunch them up, and then let go. It's quite a useful technique. And check the front of my body. And sometimes just, just like each one of you, knowing that you're cared for, actually gives you a sense of safety and peace. I care for my body that way. Just care for my digestive system. My stomach. My lungs. My heart. And all those other organs, I don't know exactly where the position in the body, livers and kidneys and stuff. If I feel any place is tight or a little bit of a pain, I will actually go there. My mindfulness will focus on that. A little bit of tightness in the, my lower back. So I put my attention there. Oh, that went pretty quickly. Just give it kindness, give it loving kindness. It's a practice of metta to my own body to a part of my body. 
my practice met on a small part of my body. If it really is metta, it, it always works. That's how I learn what metta is. I get feedback. If it's not metta, I can get that, feel that tension. Even though the pain or irritation gets worse. It's not real metta. Real matter always settles things down. And you can practice on your own body before you practice on others. Just my whole torso is feeling so much better than even five minutes ago. I'm paying attention to it, giving it kindness, relaxing it. Do the same to my arms down to my hands. For once, I've got my fingers in the right place. I don't need to adjust those. But I'm aware of my arms, just my arms, not the rest of my body. Just zooming in, focusing on, the, on them, making sure they're okay. You can feel them. Two arms either side of my body. Loose the knees ready for meditation. Go to my neck. The neck, still hay fever season, still some of the irritation in my neck. But also make sure that the neck isn't on the outside being stretched. I usually move my head back and forth to get my head the proper position on top of my neck. Not too far forward, not too far back. What is too far forward? What is too far back? You feel it. You know from your own experience how the head is balanced on top of the neck, how it feels the best. And then just to be aware of the muscles in my face. Letting them be. Stop worrying. Stop planning. Stop being anxious. Just stop right here. In this moment, you've arrived. You're here. You'll be here and open up this body and mind. Feelings on my face, the door of my heart is open to all of you. So you don't react, you're at peace. And then I sometimes do this, I don't do it so often these days, but I go into a spot between my ears and a couple of inches behind my eyes, my brain. There are not supposed to be any sensations perceivable in your brain. But nevertheless, I imagine them. Imagine your poor brain, overworked, tired. Just imagine it. Visualize it. Imagine, just imagine, just taking your brain out of the skull, putting it into a nice little her basket, the lovely little uh, mattress underneath, uh, a nice duvet on top, a lovely pillow, and saying, Brain, you've worked so hard. And thank you for all the work you've done. Now, take a rest. You don't need to measure anything, to judge anything, to plan anything, to do anything. Brain, you can let go too. Imagine my brain, however I can visualize it, and put it into a lovely, comfortable little basket. Like when you have a, a cat or a puppy, you put it to bed. I put my brain to bed so I can have some peace. And I feel my whole body. That's really peaceful. 
And then I say to myself that this is a time which I give to the Buddha and to my teacher. My meditation time. It's my, in Sri Lanka we call it Buddha Puja. Sometimes people put food on the altar. I'm not giving food, a much higher gift. It's a gift of meditation. It's not for me. So I'm giving it out of gratitude to my teacher, Ajahn Chah. Now take her off the self, me doing it, me getting something out of it. From the meditation, it's a gift. It allows me to let go more. Not a personal practice anymore. It's a service of devotion. Granting myself these moments of peace. Not watching the breath or deep meditation or even loving kindness. Peace. Stopping. Stopping right here. Not going to move. From here. If you're thinking or planning or doing anything, that's not stopping. That's the opposite. Stop. And then silence is the only thing left. And peace. Deep, deep peace. You see how deep that peace can feel. in this meditation. Be kind. May peace. Be kind. Be gentle. Second factor of the Noble Eightfold Path. If your body is restless, if your mind is restless, be kind to your mind. Mind, if you want to go think about something, okay. I'll help pack your bags and give you $20 to spend or a nice sandwich. The mind never wants to leave you if you're kind to it. Be with this mind. Get to know it and befriend it. Notice making peace. 
you're making kindness. The door of your heart is open. It doesn't block things off. In this moment. And see how much you can enjoy stopping with kindness and you disappearing. You disappear so much you don't give any more commands or orders. It's like you're gone, vanished, lost. I will now be quiet.
getting close now to the end of this session of peace. How do you feel? Why? That was a peaceful meditation, beautiful and still. You know, it's causes. There's any difficulties in the meditation? You too know the causes and their solutions. How did your body feel? Now please open your eyes. And smile. To give yourself the joy of happiness, as well as peace. Yeah, that was nice. So thank you all for listening. And we're back again in a couple of hours. So that you have a lunch now, have a beautiful lunch. Well, I would just have a cup of tea. See ya. Thank you so much, Alkin Brown. Okay, bye.